Okay. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Piton Noir Workshop, Writer's Workshop. We're very happy to have you tune in with us today. My name is Nicole Georges Bennett, and um, I'd like to introduce some of our members who are here on this particular workshop. Uh, to my bottom, what would that be? My right <laughs> is uh, Mr. Roy Sanford, and to his left is Ms. Dorothy Levy, Mrs. Dorothy Levy, and above her is our facilitator and moderator for this session, Christopher Noseworthy, who is also the editor of The Flying Crapo, which is our anthology and produced by Piton Noir. So today we are going to be dealing with some fundamentals about writing. So at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Chris to begin the session. Thank you, Chris. Okay, thank you very much, Nicole. And I'm glad to see Roy and Dorothy there with us today. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, story structure. Um, and it's going to seem like a little bit of repetition for people who've looked at this before, but I think it's been a long time since any of us thought about it consciously in our writing. Um, and it's something that I tend to place a lot of importance on. In my uh, experience, if a story doesn't have a fundamental structure or organization to it, then it can get confusing. Uh, it can create reader frustration and that's where um, things can go off the rails and you can lose readers. So, and that's obviously what we're trying to avoid. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just jump into a little bit of description. Um, I've prepared a little bit of a presentation and I would just like you to interrupt me whenever I start talking too long or you have any questions. All right, uh, do we have any initial questions before I start? No? No, I think we're good. Okay, no, so I'm just gonna me. share my screen here. That's not the screen I wanted to share, that's the one. Okay, so there we go, PowerPoint. Okay, so story structure. Um, essentially what we're talking about is the organization of your story. And what are you organizing? You're going to be organizing your characters. Okay, so each character has an arc. Each character has a, uh, a personality, an identity, a context. All of those things need to be managed. Um, and how you present those things also needs to be managed. Uh, a lot of people can end up with exposition dump. Um, exposition dump is where you just throw a lot of information about the character uh, at the reader all at once, and it's boring, and it's a good way to lose uh, readers. Um, unfortunately, with science fiction and fantasy, we do have to add a little bit more um, exposition into our writing. Oops, I didn't want that. No. <laughs> I hit a button. Um, we have to add a little bit of more exposition, exposition into our writing because of the fantastical elements of our, our stories. Um, but our readers also have a little bit more tolerance for that than other genres would. Um, that would be the comes that brings us to the setting. Um, now we are writing stories that are based in the islands. So obviously setting is going to be important because that's part of the thing that will distinguish us from other types of writers. And so personally, when I read your stories, I'd like to see more descriptions of the island to bring that flavor forward. Um, we are also trying to organize tension and action. Um, I'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, then we're gonna be part of, part of the, uh, the structure also talks about style, right? So your personal style, the words you use, how you use them, those are also part of the organization of what you're trying to do. How much dialogue are you using? How much description are you doing? Um, that kind of thing all plays into it. So you need to be aware of that. Um, when I talk about style, I also talk about uh, your sentences and your paragraphs. Do you use long paragraphs, short paragraphs? Do you mix them up? Uh, ideally, you want to mix it all up. You want to have a, uh, a variety that helps your reader not get bored with what you've put on the page. So you want to have a mixture of long sentences, and short sentences, and complex sentences, and simple sentences. It's, uh, it's important to mix that all around. And then your theme um, is going to have to come through. And your theme isn't necessarily going to be explicitly mentioned. And that's where your structure comes in. 
because you want to dose in your theme and thematic elements as you're going. So that's probably something that you'll add in after in your rounds of revision um, is, okay, so my theme is going to be, I don't know, loss. And so I'm going to be talking about loss throughout the story. Well, I have my main plot of what that is and what happens in there, but I can add elements to the story to reinforce the theme um, of loss. So for example, um, if I'm talking about the loss of my mother, um, but I can also talk about it reinforce that theory, the first scene with my character can be him losing his shoes. So although it's not directly tied to a personal loss of his mother, he's losing his shoes so that it's reinforcing that overall theme. Um, so those are things that you just want to think about and like how can I reinforce this idea as I'm going through my writing. Um, and then we go back to the fundamentals of who, what, when, where, why, and how. All of that is super important in your writing. And that's some of the, one of the things that we want to think about as we're going. Um, and sometimes you want to keep one of these hidden, like the why. Why is this happening? That could be the whole point. We want to know what the what the why is or how what the how is. And we can take that fact that we're hiding that and we can put it in little doses throughout the story, little hints, um, so that the reader can start trying to put it together in their head. So um, are there any questions about that before I move on or? Um, I do have a question and um, sorry, is somebody trying to say something? No. Okay, um, it's just about style. Would you say style and voice are synonymous or I would are, are those two distinct things? They're distinct. Um, one will, your, your style may flow from your voice. The voice is you as a writer. And that's what you as a writer are trying to say and convey with your writing and sort of it's a general, um, it's your, what's important to you as the writer that's coming through on paper, which may not be the same thing as the style that you're putting into the story. It may be very similar, but the style is how you've written the story and your voice is the mindset that you're bringing to that story. Okay, I hope that there's um, some examples or samples that we'll be looking at um, to kind of solidify that for me. Mm, I didn't put any examples in there, so we can talk about it a little bit more if you need clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so one of the first structures I wanted to look at is the three act structure. Um, and when I talk about three acts, it's just three major sections of a story. And in the first act, you're going to have character development and you're going to be setting up the conflict of the story. So character development and is, is going to be intimately tied with the setting of the story. And you're going to set those elements up right away. I want to know who this character is. I want to know what their motivations are. I want to know where they are. Um, I can't emphasize enough that I, I need to know where your character is in space. Like what's going on around this person? And that's something that if you're writing a short story needs to be intimately tied to the person's character development. So if my character is a, uh, a nurse, I don't know what I'm gonna say. If my character is like a ship builder, well, I'm gonna want him building a ship in the first part of my story so that I can establish that as part of his, this is who he is. He's a ship builder, he's doing the action, and then I can have him talking about or exploring shipbuilding so we know how passionate he is about it. And then we might have somebody come in and tell him that he can't build ships anymore. Ah, I've set up my conflict right away. And it's happened all within a couple of uh, paragraphs, maybe even a paragraph and a half with a little bit of dialogue. And all of a sudden we have a character who's passionate about something and a major problem that's happening. So, and that, that's, that's what my story is going to explore um, and try and resolve as we go. So this act is not necessarily going to be um, long, but it could be, depending on how much time you're going to spend on setting up the conflict. Um, in longer pieces of writing and novels, this will be a couple of chapters. Um, in the short story, it's only going to be a couple of pages, maybe not even, maybe a page and a half. So it, it will all depend on the length, and we'll talk about length a little bit later. Um, 
so uh, the second act um, is the confrontation. So we set up the stakes for the, the conflict. What's, what are the consequences if something, if this goes one way or the other? You know, what is this important to the character? Why do I as a reader care about what ha what's happening to this character? That's an important thing to think about. Um, if I don't care about what's going on with your character, then I'm not going to keep going. I'm just, I don't see the point of it. Um, this section is going to be the longest of all of them. This is where your main action is going to be happening throughout the story. Um, there's going to be tension about how the actions will resolve. I don't know which way this is going to go as a reader. And as a writer, you want to make sure that you keep me guessing um, the whole way through. And then we want to make sure that we see some sort of character arc or characters have arcs. And we want to see how they develop as they confront this, um, this reality or this problem that they're trying to, uh, to, to see. Um, fallouts from the actions in Act 3. So what are the consequences? Here we see it. And then we tie up the loose ends that may have been introduced. So if we want to look at The Wizard of Oz, I think The Wizard of Oz is really a good um, example of this sort of structure because we have three very separate pieces that we can see uh, visually on screen, especially. I mean, it's a novel, but it, it works the same way for film. Uh, the Wizard of Oz, the first part, we set up initial conflict with the uh, with uh, Miss Gulch and the dog and Dorothy doesn't want to be on the farm anymore and we meet all the characters and we, we hear about their motivations and she just wants to leave the farm and then um, then we that that's sort of the conflict is like she wants to leave the farm but she loves her family and there's, there's tension there and then we go to uh, Oz and all of a sudden Dorothy's got a huge problem to resolve she's got a homicidal witch that's trying to kill her and so she meets these friends along the way and she, she learns about herself and she learns about what's really important in life and then finally when she gets to the uh, the end of the road the uh, end of the yellow brick road um, she gets what she wants, but she discovers she had it the whole time. So we learn, it's almost like a, uh, what's, what, what's the word? It's almost like she's, I can't remember the word. I've got like half French, half English words in my head and it's not making any sense. Um, but it's almost like a counter, it's like she should have known it was there all, the, all along. So the, the resolution comes very quickly at the end of the story. And then when she wakes up from her dream, uh, she's like, oh, well, this is where I belong. I, I, I knew that and I was just doubting myself. And she comes back to that. And so all the loose ends in the story are very neatly tied up. Um, so I'll, there's, a, there's a visual here that I wanted to show everybody. So we have the, the setup, the confrontation, the resolution. After that crisis, there's a very, that's where she kills the witch. Um, there's a very quick resolution to the story because, you know, all of the major ideas have been resolved. So this is a very classic structure um, that that a lot of writing will take. And this will hold true for any style of writing or any size of writing. Um, are there any questions about this? Okay, I find, um, well, it seems to follow very virtually structure for play where you have the exposition, the rise in action climax, and where you have the, well, the denouma, as um, they call it. But um, in a play, you have more leeway. A short story for only 2,000 words, you know, you would almost have to jam pack every line with something meaningful, which is what it should be, you know? so. As I said, I mean, I, I like the idea of that structure, but um, can you get that done in 2,000, 2,500 words? I, I, I love that you brought that up, Dorothy, because I think that's exactly um, the challenge of a short story. Um, in novels, longer pieces of writing, even plays, you have a little bit more leeway. You can meander a little bit more through these things, but in shorter pieces of writing, you need to hit all of the notes um, in order to make the story work. And so, yeah, you need to make it, 
you need every line needs to count. Why is that there? What is it? Uh, what what is it trying to accomplish? Is it setting up the next uh, crisis that's going to happen? Is it explaining something that I need to know so that I can understand the motivation of the character? Um, everything has to have a purpose. And so, as you're writing your story, the first draft, you're not going to have all of those things in place. That's okay. Um, but that's the kind of um, thinking that you need to take to the uh, editing phase of your writing. And that's what I do when I'm editing is I'm like, okay, why are we saying this? What's going on? Like, why am I, why am I talking about um, this person's dream? Is that important to the story or is she just having a daydream? I, I don't get it. It doesn't make the theme any more important. It doesn't help me at all. Um, but in a short story, you don't have the space to waste time like that. You need to make sure that everything counts and that you're all building to something. So mm -hmm. um, one of the techniques that I use um, back, especially when I print things out, is I like to section it off. And so, okay, if I'm reading the story and I'm, I'm like, okay, this is the introduction. I think this is where the introduction ends. Okay, now we're starting into the rising action. Um, so then I would block that off and go, okay, this is the rising action section. And then here is the crisis in the denouement. And from there, I know, okay, this is the, this is the beginning. What elements need to be in the beginning? This is the middle. What elements have to be in the middle? And then this is the end. What elements need to be in the end? And think very consciously about those elements and making sure that they all fit together properly. Thanks. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll move on to the, uh, the second type because there's, there's many different structures you can adopt. Um, I don't care which one people use. I just need to see evidence of one. I need to make sure that uh, the flow and the, the pacing of the story makes sense together. So we have A Hero's Journey, which is a very fundamental uh, story style in our cultures. Um, we always want to see a hero going on a quest, and that's specifically important in fantasy. You'll notice that my three examples are all fantasy. Um, and we have very specific steps that happen in those types of stories. Um, I'm not going to bother reading them out to you, but you can see that in every one of these stories, there is a mentor character. There is a, an enemy that's clearly identified. There's an ordeal. There's some sort of talisman or some sort of um, important object that you need to uh, acquire or whatever, because that part of the story doesn't matter. What matters is how your hero moves through space and develops as a, as a person uh, in an effort to resolve this story. Um, I think this is easier to see on a visual. Um, we have, you know, thinking of Lord of the Rings, you know, he starts in the Shire, he has to go on an adventure, doesn't really want to do it, gets convinced to do it by the mentor, goes on the adventure, has some tests and allies and enemies, he meets some friends and they do some stuff. Um, then they go into uh, an area of danger, he is tested, he is rewarded for succeeding on his test, then he goes back home, he is resurrected, now that is metaphorical, he gets changed in some way, um, how he becomes a new person, a different person, and then he goes back with the object into the ordinary world. So it's it's a cyclical thing, and we can see how the person develops as the story goes. You so sound like Homer, this... man. You sound like Homer, Chris. <laughs> 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 right, in his Odyssey and so and Virgin. Yes. Yeah, I think that's um, exactly the the type of um, archetype that we're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of um, an every man who has to step out of his comfort zone and, you know, has to face all these crises. And, um, you know, uh, as you said, there's a sort of a resurrection at the end of it. I think almost every building's Roma or any every... Um, action adventure story I've, I've ever read kind of follows this sort of these steps. Yeah. And there are variations on it and things can be moved and the order can be changed. Um, but 
it's it's a predictable pattern and readers like predictable patterns. Um, you can change them obviously and you can mo modify things, but um, there's a reason the Hunger Games follows the same pattern as the Lord of the Rings. Like even the names sound similar when you put them together like that. But um, it's because you've got somebody who's living an ordinary life and gets thrust into an adventure and then she comes back home. And every part of every novel in that series follows the same pattern. And uh, that makes it uh, on one hand really easy for a reader to follow what's going on. We know sort of what to expect next. And uh, as a writer, we sometimes want to violate that expectation and change things up. But we also want to make sure that the writer has confidence that we know where we're going. So we need to make sure that we follow the pattern, um, but not make it super obvious for the writer, reader. So in a short story, this is probably not an ideal structure for a short story, just because like Dorothy was saying earlier, we don't have the length. Yeah, I was, I was about to say, I was about to, um, sorry, I was about to uh, uh, mention that, you know, how do you tackle something like that with 1,500 words, you or 2,000 words, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, no, you can't, but what you can do with a short story is take a section of this circle and use that as a short story. So right. if I'm going to be talking about the ordeal, uh, for example, where, um, Frodo goes into the cavern to get the ring uh, from uh, Schmeagel, then I can ver do very quickly do an introduction to the characters and then have him go through uh, into the cave, have an ordeal, and then come out of the cave. Um, I can do that in, in like 15, 2500 words. Um, so that's something that when you're thinking about, okay, I eventually want to make this into a longer piece of writing or what part of the hero's journey is going to fit into what I'm trying to write. Um, you can always pick part of it. Like the resurrection might be super interesting. Like that might be where your character comes back into the village and they've changed and the village has to react to that. That can be a really interesting story. Um, and you can just, you don't have to tell the reader everything, right? Like I don't, you just know that he went away. He thinks he's something special now and he's come back with this stupid ring and he thinks he's, thinks he's better than everyone else, right? That's a great story, right? And you can introduce that the rest of this circle with a, like a paragraph or two, maybe not even, or with a line of dialogue from another character. Oh, there's Frodo. He's come back with the ring. You know, he thinks he saved the world, and then Frodo's got to deal with that. You know, like that's that's really cool. Mm, okay. Yeah. Any other questions about this? No? Okay. All right. I, I'm sorry, before we move on, if mm. you, you know, you talk about picking certain elements, what would be an ideal, I guess, um, what would you pick in a short story? What elements or should you pick so that you have a complete story within your word limit? Which, which of these things would you would you, would you probably start from the ordinary world, a call to adventure, maybe skip the part about the mentor, um, go straight to the trials or the ordeals, you know, then the, the resolution. How would you? What I would do is I wouldn't, I wouldn't fit this into a short story. Ah, I wouldn't okay. fit all, all these 12. It's too much going on. Right. What I would do is I would, spoke, I would focus on one of them. And oh, I, I would, okay. and I would yada yada yada, uh, what came before, and uh, the resolution would just be the end. Uh, the resolution to your story, the denouement, would just be the end of that scene, for example. Um, so, if we're going to talk about meeting the mentor, that can be very traumatic if we want it to be, or that can be a joyous experience. Like, we can talk about how you know um, Nicole Georges wants to meet. Um, the the wise wizard up in the for uh, up in the mountain, and so she's got to go through the the jungle path with all these trials to go meet the mentor. It, that, that 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 can be a perfectly great short story. Um, we don't know what comes after, but we don't need to know. Um, and her motivation for um, why she's going up the mountain can be can be interspersed in the story, and that can help us understand. Hey. You know, she's getting beaten, eaten by bugs and attacked by orcs and 
you know, fell down the river or whatever, and why is she continuing? And then, then we can find out that she's got this personal connection to somebody who's sick and she wants to find the tchotchke that's going to help heal her sick mother. And that's why she's continuing and her mother's really important to her. And you can have a couple of series of flashbacks or whatever, but it's, it's essentially going to meet the mentor. And that's what your story is. That's part of what that story is. And if you wanted to, you could start writing backward or forward from there to expand that writing to create a full hero's journey in a novel form if you wanted to do that later. Interesting. Thank you. Okay, so there was technically there's another uh, another type of uh, uh, story format. It's the five milestones. I find this very similar to the um, the three act, but it's a little bit more in detail. Um, you'll notice that we people disagree on what format things are, which shows you that structure can be flexible and you can interpret how things have been structured based on your own perceptions, but everybody agrees that there is structure there. So um, if it follows this specific format or not is really not as important as the fact that it does follow um, some sort of structure. So I like this picture, so I'm gonna show it to you. Um, it's a little bit more of a mountain than a hill. And so we've got these uh, roller coasters. I love the idea of roller coasters because in French they're called Russian mountains. And I love the idea that you're sort of going up and down these mountains and it can be very dangerous. Um, so we're setting it up. We've got, this is obviously the Hunger Games. Um, you know, poor family, tragic future. You know, this is the setup of the story. This is where we're beginning. Um, this is the inciting incident. This is what causes the conflict. She has to go and volunteer for these games. She goes into the games, uh, things change. You know, may the odds be ever in your favor. You know she's gonna die. She's probably gonna die. Um, but there's a little bit of hope um, and she gets it from PETA. And then the climax is where she resolves the, uh, where the incident resolves. So there's, there's a series of ups and downs. So every section of the story has a similar shape to it, but the stakes get higher every time you go from one section to the other. Okay, so it can look like the three act play. Um, this is just broken down a little bit more and with, with more um, climaxes throughout the story. Um, a writer who uses this to his advantage is uh, Jim Butcher. He, he writes the Dresden novels and it's about this wizard. And he's got this 12, 14, 15 book series where this wizard is constantly trying to save the world and every chapter almost is a mini a mini adventure a mini climax the stakes are raised gradually as the book goes on until the big baddie fight happens at the end of the novel and then he gets a power up and uh then it happens again in the next book and in the next one so it's a very predictable structure that as a reader um i can see and identify and enjoy um, makes it easy for me to read quickly because i know exactly what's going to be happening all the way through um, but he didn't, he doesn't do that without thinking about it. Um, he probably has an idea now after having written 20 books or whatever that he knows how to build, but as you're going through back into your story, you want to look, okay, how am I building this conflict from one section of the story to the next? Because you're going to have different scenes, things are going to change. How am I building that tension? Um, how are the stakes getting bigger? And that's something that uh, you definitely want to look at as you're um, re reworking your story, right? So you want to go back to those. Um, and I think my next slide talks about that. No. Okay. So we want to go back to those elements of character setting, uh, tension, style, you know, how are those things moving in my story? And in each part of my story, what elements of those are in there and if they're not in there then you need to add them in and like Dorothy was saying every word has to count especially in a shorter story okay. um, so that gets me to word count so I pulled this this is uh, I think it's the nebula awards this is how they decide what they call things so we have a short story that's what's most relevant to us right now 
Uh, it's 20 to 7,500 words, okay? And in that, we have to decide about the importance of length, pacing, plots and subplots, the complexity of the conflict, the time span, and the depth. Obviously, with a short story, you don't have a lot of space. You don't have a lot of time to develop any of this. So my suggestion is to focus on one central conflict. And if you focus on that one central conflict and how to build to it and how to resolve it, then the rest of it becomes more obvious. Um, if I'm going to have a story where the main conflict is um, a discussion between the mom and the dad about an affair, okay? So we've got this affair going on and it's been discovered. How deep I can get into that conversation, how much backstory I can put into there um, will depend on the length. And do I want to introduce the girlfriend or the boyfriend? Maybe I do, but that's going to take up a lot of time and that's an extra character and that means extra subplots and uh, I don't have the space for it. So I'm going to want to maybe take that person out and may just focus on the personality conflict or the, the, the emotional conflict between the, the two parents, right? Um, yeah, so subplots are something that happen in longer pieces of writing. In short stories, subplots are really probably too much. I would just stick with one central idea and move it through. And that's something that I've I've seen a lot in the writing is that um, the idea, the stories will move from one idea to the to another, but in 5,000 words, I don't see the justification for it. I don't know why you're doing that. You have so little space, you could explore that one person uh, more in depth, and that would make it a, a much richer story. Um, I don't know if I'm making any sense here. Uh, are, are there no, any no, questions? No, you're, no you're, doing, you're, making, you're making lots of sense. Okay, good, good. <laughs> well, I remember um, being told or taught, you know, the, among the elements of a short story, there was even this Latin phrase, you begin in media three, in the middle of the story, and you get right into it. And they had even suggested it should be no longer than three days. I mean, maybe this is an old, style. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not even sure where it was taken from. But of course, perhaps because of my age, I'm ancient. So when I was taught the elements of a short story, maybe a method used is even considered archaic or obsolete today. I'm not sure. You know, I'm no. not, so I don't know if I'm making sense that it, it said you begin in media in the middle of the action. Mm -hmm. So you instead of the fairy tale beginning once upon a time to make your short story interesting you begin in the middle of the action and that the time of the action you are talking about should maybe be no longer than three days and of course you had all the other elements character development etc but i'm not sure if any of those things still apply today or if they're even taught or thought about Dorothy, I think you and I had a very similar education. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was taught the very same thing. Uh, you start, if for a short story, you start where the action is. You hook them in with conflict, you hook them in with, uh, with something that's happening, you hit, hook them in with the stakes, and you can fill in important information afterwards. Um, I hadn't heard the idea of three days. I think that makes sense. Um, three days for me, if I'm going to uh, apply that to a 7,500 word uh, story, that very clearly gets me into uh, 2,500 words per section per day. I think that's reasonable. Um, and uh, I think uh, if you want to get into, if you want to hook your reader, especially in a short story, you need to hook them right away. Um, in novels, usually you get a couple of pages or a chapter. So you don't get that in a short story. You have to do it right away. So you start with your character bleeding and crawling towards their doom, uh, and then you find a way to save them. You know, <laughs> and that's what's interesting. That's what's gonna have, what's gonna keep uh, keep your readers reading. Yeah. But you are very generous with your word count. Most of the short stories we see advertised today just give 
of maximum 3,000 words and you're going way above 7,000. Well, that was, I just, I'm taking the maximum of what, uh, of what Nebula had, uh, had chosen. So yeah, you're going to have to dose, or uh, that's the French way, you, you're going to have to judge what you can include based on how much you're allowed to submit or what you want to, how, where you want to finish up. Um, I think 7,500 words is quite long um, and you would have more time to do this. Um, I did a little bit of quick math here so that we could see what that would look like in a short story um, if we use 7,500 words, but if you chopped up that down to 3,000, that gives you an idea of how much space you should dedicate to each section. So the three the the, the three act structure 2,500 words, but if we want to have uh, a 3,000 word limit, you're looking at a thousand words per section, with a little bit of padding on either side. You know, there's some wiggle room, but it, if you want to apply a structure retroactively to your story, you can go okay, you can highlight the first thousand words and go, hey, am I done my introduction here? Have I moved on to the the central action and and and, and that the central conflict, and then okay, here's my ending. Now, I think a thousand words for an ending in a short story is probably a bit much. I would, most of your text, I think, would be your your, your middle section. Uh, a hero's journey, I just don't think is doable in a short story. You had 7,500 7, words, 625 words per section. Sounds a bit of a breakneck pace. You don't even have time to tell me your character, uh, I don't know, wears red shoes in that amount of, that, that, that amount of space. Um, and so you have to think about all of these elements again, the character setting, action, style, theme, and how you're fitting those into each section of whatever structure you have adopted. Okay, okay so, so in a short story, um, it's important that your characters have exaggerated qualities. We want to have a very quick idea of who this person is, and we don't necessarily need them to be realistic or likable, um, because we're only gonna be with them for a short amount of time, and we don't have to ask the reader to be in the mind of somebody they don't like for very long. So that's something to to remember as you're writing, like who is this character? And I should have a very clear idea of who this character is right from the get-go. You know, the little girl who yells, oh, you're such a bitch, mom. Okay, I know who that character, I know who that little girl is. Like I know where, what she's feeling in that moment and I get an idea of what the relationship is between the mother and the daughter in that moment. So that's something that I can hook on to as a writer and develop more fully. Okay, maybe that was just a moment of passion Maybe it was just her being a 13 year old girl, or it could be an indication of a more fundamental flaw in their relationship um, that I want to explore in the rest of my short story. But it gets me hooked in. Um, and that moment of disrespect um, will be what I hang my story on because that can be really interesting to a reader. Okay, so we also want to make sure that you introduce the world of the character and their place in it. Um, what's interesting, um, I wanna be intrigued, I wanna know the mystery. Again, this is where I think physical space is important, telling me where your character is in space, what's happening, um, what, uh, how are they moving in that space relative to the other people. Don't need to bog us down with logistics, but if all of a sudden somebody has a conversation and I didn't know that they were there, that's a problem. So, um, and again, I think as a uh, Dominican writers group, I think this is where um, your place will be important and uh, bringing that out. Uh, yeah. So what's the problem? Okay, again, as Dorothy very wisely stated, uh, we want to get to that problem very quickly in a short story. Okay, so we start in the middle of the action and we move from there and supply any background as we need to. Um, the characters should try to solve the problem, but ideally they should fail, right? We want to make sure that there's tension and that's where the failure is important. You know, maybe the character failed because they hadn't realized um, something important about themselves. And so it's a moral failing or maybe it's 
you know, she just didn't choose the right combination on the safe, so she wasn't able to open it up and it, and it just broke on her. So now she's got to figure out another way to do it. So you're adding in another um, place for your character to develop because there's a new problem, one that probably that they're partially responsible for. And so that's really interesting. Okay. And then, yeah, so then that gets, uh, that gets me to just sort of things that I want people to think about before they submit writing. Um, they read their story and they're like, what's the point? What is the point of my story? I know it sounds a bit harsh, but I'm trying to communicate an idea with my writing. And if the idea does not sound interesting to you, then maybe it won't be interesting to other people. So um, one, uh, one of the uh, things that I like to do is I like to write from a place of uh, frustration or a place of, uh, of uh, indignation. I want to, to make people believe what I believe. And so I, I build my stories around that. Um, and then as I'm looking through the story, I maybe have a whole section that talks about this character's relationship with um, the snow. Well, if that doesn't impact the story in any important way, then regardless of how prettily I've written it, I don't want to include it because it's not going to help my reader. Um, is what's happening logical? Um, it's amazing how often people don't think about this when they're writing. <laughs> they, in their heads, it makes sense to them, but to somebody from the outside, you need to come back and go, okay, is what's happening a logical consequence of what's been said before? And uh, sort of reflection questions that need to happen. And then is the major conflict resolved? Then for that, you need to know what your major conflict is. And that, that was sort of the point of that question for me is I wanted to uh, make reader or writers think about um, what they're trying to say in their writing. So that is all that I have for um, formal presentation. Um, but I would be more than happy to uh, have people ask me more questions so that we can flesh this out a little bit. I find um, the point of view can be challenging at times because you know you forget that you are if you are using well. If you're using the what is it the omniscient narration then that is you know so difficult if you're using the first person narrator to tell the story you tend to forget that the person does not have the ability to see things that are happening a thousand miles away so i guess it has to be written from a different perspective or in a different way you know, because when they speak a point of view, I find, you know, the first person narration difficult to maintain in a story entirely. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. No, that's an excellent point. The first person narration is, I find I, I can't use it. it. It It's very limiting. And unless you're willing to accept that limitation, it's, mm -hmm. it's impossible. Uh, when you use first person, person narration, it tends to lead to an untrustworthy narrator. And that's a very interesting device, but I don't think it has a place in a short story unless that's part of what you're trying to communicate. Um, so it's also, it can be very off-putting to readers if they don't identify with your main character. Mm -hmm. um, if you keep saying I and um, your character is a six-year-old girl, well, maybe I'm going to have a hard time with that, um, especially if she knows things that she shouldn't, uh, that a six-year-old wouldn't know. So it's, it's, it, there's a lot of considerations when you're writing with that, that, uh, that, that narration style. So third-person omniscient is generally the easiest to work with because then you can switch um, points of view and you can switch um, settings more easily. But again, in a short story, I would discourage people from doing that and making those switches just because there's just not a lot of space for that to happen. Um, if I have to switch 
uh, points of view in the middle of a story that's only 3,000 words long, uh -huh. I, it just gets disconcerting. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was I was wondering though. Um, let's say, for example, you are using a the first person, and um, uh, let's say you want the narrator to be, uh, let's say, a seven-year-old narrating the story. Um, where would you kind of draw the line between a, a, a you know, a seven-year-old and someone who's trying to make the story as interesting as, as you know, as what I mean. So would it be would it be in the narration itself, or would it be in the in the conversation? Dialogue is always interesting, so I would always include a lot of dialogue. Um, then, yeah, right. The uh, the typical seven-year-old isn't very reflective, so right. I would naturally put more dialogue that would explain what's going on. So maybe your seven-year-old is listening to an adult conversation, and that can be very that can explain some of the more complex stuff that's going on. Um, your seven-year-old can have questions about what's happening. Um, and can have maybe hints of insight into what's going on around uh, him or her. And that might be what you need to accomplish. Um, I'm writing a story right now about a 12-year-old. And 12-year-olds do understand the world, but they don't understand all of it. Um, and there's one part where he hears his dad talk about um, uh, the police going on a domestic call uh, at a neighbor's house. And he doesn't know what that means right? Like we do as adults, but a 12 year old probably doesn't know what a domestic call is. And so he has questions about that. And he's like, okay, well, I know the word domestic means house, but why would the police make a house call? And so he's having a, a, a sort of a 12 year old reflection on what that means. He's wrong, but it also lets the reader understand that and gives that reader that sympathy for what's happening, lets the reader know what's going on next door. Um, but the character doesn't. So, so the mentality of the, well, let's say, seven-year-old uh, has to be present in both the narr narration and the dialogue, basically. If you want. You could also make it in a, an adult who's talking about themselves as a seven-year-old, and then you get around all of that child mentality. Uh, right. So in the narration, they could explain, well, you know, I was only seven, uh, seven, seven years old. I didn't know what a domestic call was, but now I know that my neighbor's wife was being beaten every night. So that's something that your older narrator can talk about um, in their younger self. Right. I find when a young narrator is used, it can also create some humor or it can also give insight into a situation which the seven or 10 year old does not understand, but an adult would. You know, when the 10 or seven year old would point out situation, I mean, I'm just thinking, even that movie, um, Forrest Gump, who is really like a child. Oh. And then in one of these scenes where he says, and the lights were coming on and on, and um, I think he was talking about Nixon. I think it was President Nixon when he was spying into some, or he had something set up to investigate. But anyway, the way they describe certain situations, would be on their level in on one sense, but as an for meaning into it. So that could be an interesting technique. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, good afternoon. I just wanted to see the one before the last slide. Again, briefly, please. Second, one before the last. Okay. Oh, by, the, by the way, are you going to send uh, uh, a copy of the slides for, so we could at least, you know, just go over them or something to that effect? Yeah, I can share that for sure. Yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I would, I would love to have some of it in my files. Is this the slide you were talking about, Gloria? Hello?
sorry, I was mute. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is it. Okay. Thanks. Did you have a specific question or did you just want to see my brilliance on paper again? <laughs> because I was kind of going through it. I took a note and then you changed mm -hmm. it before. Yeah. I, I went by very quickly. That's true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Chris. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. I just had a comment to make as we were talking about um, unreliable narrators. One of the most brilliant stories I ever read was um, by Agatha Christie, who is one of my favorite authors. And it was uh, the murder of Roger Ackroyd. And I won't give it away to anyone who hasn't read it yet, but we become very immersed in the story and invested in the narrator who turns out to be extremely <laughs> unreliable. But by the time we uncover the truth, we, we were almost like devastated to find out that we could not trust um, our narrator, you know, as a, as a reader. But I thought it was a brilliant strategy. And I think she was probably one of the first people to use that, um, that technique um, it stands out as, you know, one of her most unusual stories. And she, you know, she wrote quite prolifically. Mm -hmm. And um, the other comment I have is that one of the scariest stories I ever read was told through the, um, told through the eyes or the voice of a six-year-old. And all she was doing was sort of explaining what mommy and daddy were doing and what her day was like. And she's like, you know, I eat, I eat cold cereal or I ate my cold cereal and I was happy because, um, you know, I found a marshmallow and usually there, there weren't marshmallows in my cereal, but today must be a special day because I found a marshmallow. And then it's, it sort of builds tension from there because she's just describing how her parents are going about her day and how unusual her day is. Um, and you find, and you kind of get the impression that her life is very bleak, usually, and to the point of, of abusive. But of course, she doesn't know that. This is just her, this is her normal. This is her reality. And right. by the time we get to the end, you're, you realize that something very tragic is about to unfold. And you kind of want to rescue this child from this situation. So I think it takes skill by the author to use the, those type of narrators, those type of uh, first person accounts. And I certainly, um, I wouldn't recommend it to a first time author, um, which might be a bit presumptuous of me to say so, but I, I've, I've seen it used effectively, but it really does take some technique and skill to pull it off is my comment. No, I would, I would definitely echo that. I think it's, uh, it's trap laden and it, but I can guarantee you that those elements of tragedy in that story were not there in the first couple of drafts. They were added as the editing happened and it's like, okay, how can I make this more bleak? And, oh, this section isn't, doesn't have enough of a hint in it and I need to add another one in and that kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's very important to, um, keep your ultimate goal in mind and playing with your form on top on top of uh, on top of your um, content can be can be a challenge and we don't read a lot of first person stories and so we have a harder time reproducing that in our own writing um, it's just it's not as common as it used to be and it's not as presumed um, by uh, yeah, I, uh, I think it's, it's something to be wary of. And I think the strong folk tradition, folktale tradition in, in Dominican writing um, can lead people to using the first person a bit more than I think I've seen in other, uh, in other groups, just because that, that folktale does focus on a person and what they're saying. Um, but it comes out in it comes out in, a, in, in, in something that isn't as interesting in a, um, a folk tale, but would be great around a fire, if, if you understand the difference. Uh, in a short story, you want to hook into that action right away, and you want dialogue to move it forward, and you want a strong perspective, but in a, in a folk tale-y type thing, you don't necessarily get that right away. 
um, so that the structures are slightly different. Gloria, are we done with the slide? Yes, I am. Thanks much. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Um, I don't really have a question, but as you were talking about the first person, it just brought back something to me because I had a story in the first person, and when we had to do to um, con to convert it to a movie, um, it sort of had to change around things. So you know, it, it just brought that back to me because it was a situation where this young boy was talking about a day in his life, something that happened, um, but when we had to do the movie. Then, and we had to introduce the other characters we had to put in at the dialogue. Because you know? it, it, it couldn't work just with him talking. So we had to kind of show the story then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's an excellent point. So it highlights the limitations of that voice, but those limitations can be where the creativity comes in as well. So it's not something to necessarily avoid if you have a point to it. And um, I don't want to sound harsh on that one, but if you don't have a reason for having chosen the first person, then it's probably not the right move. Um, you're trying to accomplish, you're, you're, you're limiting your viewpoint and you would do that with intent and purpose. And I, I think that's my main um, theme today is things need to be purposeful. They need to be intentional. And I think that's something that, uh, like we all have a, a, a schema of, um, what a story is in our heads and what shape that look, what, what shape that'll take. And the type of uh, theme and idea that we want to get across will, will mold that, 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 uh, that form in, in our heads, but it'll never be perfect when you put it on paper the first time. And so you need to go back and look at, okay, where is my structure? Where are my key elements and how do they hold together? What is my golden thread in this story? Um, you can have a golden and a silver and a, and a bronze, but in a short story, you want to just have a golden thread and you want to make sure that they're all connected and that they work together. Is it braided? Is it fraying? Um, and make sure that if somebody asks you what the structure is, you can actually come up with an answer and say, okay, well, this is where he does this and this is why he does that. And then it goes here so that that all fits together. Um, you don't want the reader just to have the impression that your character is wandering around doing nothing and having things happen to them. That's not interesting. Let me ask you, uh, the same way you have, let's say, abstract paintings, can it be that you just write because you're inspired and you just decide to write without thinking about this mm -hmm. element, that element, it comes together, and maybe you deal with that after? Because that's how I write. You know, I get this thing, I get up, and then I'm just like, okay, mm -hmm. I just start writing. I don't think about golden thread and all these things there. I just go for it, and when I'm finished, so I change it and I read it again, you know? Um, so is that, I mean, that's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. That's beautiful. I think the, I think you, you, you bring up an interesting point. Um, paintings are visual and you, 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 you see them all at once. Uh, you will stop and you will look at different elements and see how they all play together, but you see it all at once. You take it in all at once, but reading is not like that. Reading is very linear. And so although you'll write that way, and I, I write that way too, um, you'll want to make sure that as your reader is going through your story linearly, because they have to, because that's how reading works, um, that there's something for them to follow as they're going through. And I think every story has an element of mystery in it, um, regardless of what genre it's in. There's always information being hidden from the reader. And as the writer, you need to make sure that you know what that information is being, what information is being hidden and why, and what hints you're giving to that information throughout the story. Yeah. Okay. So if nobody else has any comments, I think that that'll be a, a good place to end for today. Um, so I would thank everybody for being here and for listening to me rant and uh, ramble on. And uh, as always, I'm open to questions and comments uh, if you have any uh, at any other moment. So.
So uh, I think I will thank you for just for being here, and uh, we'll leave it at that. All, All right, right, man. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And uh, Chris, um, when is our next session? Oh, oh, good question. Um, give me two seconds. I will find that right away. Oh, where am I? It is a 19. I think it's going to be in August, if I'm not mistaken. We're skipping July? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know everything, Nicole. <laughs> I, I actually, I very intentionally don't retain many dates. Uh, my brain has other things to worry about. I'm sure. But this is a priority. It, you're very true. You're very right. And I apologize for not having been more... Um, We'll think attentive. about forgiving you. We'll, we will consider it. Yes, it's we are. Advisement. We are doing July seventeenth. Okay, is that a Saturday afternoon as well? It is. Okay, everybody. So please uh, make a note that we will be back here five p.m. Eastern time on July the seventeenth. Um, I guess it's a bit early to talk about what topic we will be discussing. I don't have a specific topic in mind, so I'm uh, at this point, but I'm open to suggestions if people have specific things that they'd like to work on. Okay. I would just say that um, I would like to see some, because I work better with like examples of, of things, and um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to maybe review uh, some samples of writing, you know, maybe that you consider to be good, um, a good standard of mm -hmm. what a, sh a good short story should be as well as maybe something that doesn't work as successfully so that we can kind of compare what works what does not work um i know for someone like me that would really um solidify things in my head because i can you know i think the slides show is amazing and i think that that's some really solid information that we can all walk away with and i know that i'll be trying to apply that a bit to um, my work. And um, I think review uh, of other people's work is another great tool that we should have. So just a, a suggestion here. Okay, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll prepare something different for that. That'll work, yeah. I just, I guess one of my, um, you know, I'm just gonna stop the